executive director of the World Peace Foundation. Um, those of you who are familiar with the World Peace Foundation will know that according to the terms of our endowment, when world peace is achieved, we go out of business. And you will not be surprised to learn that uh, a couple of weeks ago, our, uh, the board of our endowment had its annual vote and voted that world peace had not been achieved and that we were still in business. But the purpose of, of, of our um, talk today is, is um, to introduce Dr. Salam Kidani and her book, which I will uh, hold up. I don't know if you can see it very well. So um, Salam is from Eritrea. She's a psychotherapist trained in London at the Institute of Family Therapy. She's a researcher on several programs related to refugees' resilience and mental health with the Globalization, Accessibility, Innovation and Care program at Tilburg University in the Netherlands, from where she recently earned her PhD. She's worked with a number of refugee and war-affected communities, including Eritreans, Ugandans, and separated refugee children. Salam is a practicing systemic therapist in London, and this book is her piece drawing on her PhD research. Now, the... Uh, but the order of business is I'm going to hand over to Salam to make the presentation. She has some slides. Um, and then we will go into a QA. and a um, And I think the, we will, um, um, Delia, who is here, will moderate the questions. And, and, and I think we will have uh, participants ask verbally. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, so let, uh, let Delia know. So Salam. It's a pleasure. It's a shame you can't be here in person, but the next best thing is to have you online. Do I still need to? All right. Yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, uh, both for the invitation, but also for the work that uh, you are doing and um, also for the interest in uh, in my country, Eritrea, but in the Horn of Africa as a whole. So it's an honor to be here. I'll um, share my screen and we can start with the uh, presentation. Uh, okay, so the title of uh, the book and also this presentation is actually uh, is Trauma, Collective Trauma and Refugee Trajectories in the Digital Era. And um, it, it starts with my observations uh, on the third um, on the third of October, twenty thirteen, um, a boat carrying migrants uh, from uh, the coast of Misrata in Libya sank just uh, off the coast of Lampedusa in Italy, and uh, three hundred and sixty six people uh, died. A lot of them, nearly all of them. Uh, of the 366, I think only six were not Eritrean. The rest, uh, over 300, um, 366 is a number that we so often use, but uh, uh, there, there are people still unaccounted for. And there remain about 300, maybe just over 300 were actually all Eritrean. And amongst the dead were um, very small children with their mothers, mothers with several children and, um, including a, a pregnant woman, uh, Johanna was her name, and uh, she was eight months pregnant, and she actually sank, um, she actually gave birth to her baby boy as, as she sank. And at the time, we were all shocked, not just as air trains, but because of where that accident, it wasn't the first or Indeed, sadly, it wasn't the last, uh, but uh, it was such a tragic situation and because of the proximity to Italy, um, there was quite a lot of media interest and um, everybody was asking why, why, why does, um, why would anybody risk their lives like that uh, in order to save it and um, and, and, and that is that was the observation that that um, started my inquiry as to why um, it's uh, so I kind of, everyone came up with all sorts of different um, different 
theories as to why. And part of uh, part of that was the push and pull theory, uh, whereby it's better in Europe and people are looking for um, for a better life in Europe. That's why they're uh, risking their life. But that didn't add up for me because because of the risk and for many of us actually because of the risk that they were taking now. As a psychotherapist, I I know. Uh, the prevalence of um, as a psychotherapist, particularly working with a lot of refugees uh, here in the UK from different countries, we're we're very aware of the number um, of the amount of uh, traumatic stress and um, post-traumatic stress disorder amongst refugees. In fact, that that is something that is uh, widely available uh, in in literature. So we know full well that. Um, uh, traumatic stress and traumatization is something that that is uh, that's common amongst refugees. So my interest then uh, be uh, became, uh, you know, are we looking at the impacts of trauma here? Is 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 it trauma that is making you know people not you know not able to settle or uh, not able to comprehend the the amount or the level of risk entailed in the kinds of uh, crossings and. Uh, crossing the Mediterranean is not the only risk. The risk is shoot to kill at the borders. Um, very difficult uh, crossings are, are, are along the Sahara where uh, where people are prone to being abducted and held for ransom, being sold, uh, and women and men are raped quite regularly. Uh, people die of thirst. Uh, people are killed by bandits and all sorts of things. So the, the, the route uh, from the Horn of Africa or in, in elsewhere in Africa to the uh, to the Mediterranean coast and then across the Mediterranean coast, it's all um, uh, full of risks. And then, of course, even within Europe, once people get to Italy, then they then cross to Switzerland or Germany or other places like that, or indeed to um, to France, where uh, they can spend months in the cold in in uh, in Calais uh, to cross to the UK, and and so my hypothesis was that um, that maybe trauma, the level of trauma that we we have in in refugees, certainly in Eritrean refugees, might be uh, causing them, you know, might might be causing them to be unable to. Uh, uh, to to unable to um, account for uh, for this risk, they know it has information, but they are unable to uh, use that information to you know their cognitive abilities have been so diminished by uh, by trauma and post traumatic stress perhaps that they're unable to. Um, uh, to make that decision, it's it's impacting on on their decision. It's impacting on their decisions re regarding the migration trajectories. And um, I also was wanted to see uh, to not just look at the Eritrean community, but also uh, look at a, a different community, perhaps a more settled community. And so I had uh, I I had a I the part of the research was also conducted in northern Uganda among. Um, uh, returnees, uh, mostly women, who were victims of the IRA abductions mostly, and then of course in Tigray amongst Eritrean refugees. Uh, from the start we were very aware of uh, the experiences of the people that we were talking to uh, both in Uganda and amongst Eritrean refugees. Uh, as um, Van der Kock says in his seminal book, The Body does indeed keep the score. I mean, it was visible in the bodies of these people, the amount of um, traumatic experiences they've had, both, both en route, but for many, even in their countries of origin, uh, traumatization began uh, for some when they were quite small, uh, for others as young people, for others as, as they left their country, after they have left their countries, um, some had prison experiences, some simply grew up with like abject, abject poverty because of the uh, political situations in their respective countries, both in Uganda and in Eritrea. And uh, for many, uh, it was um, the 
prevalent situation of um, children growing up without fathers or children growing up with, without both parents because they're either in the case of air trans either as soldiers or as um, prisoners or people who have left the country uh, so uh, yeah so so we I was very aware of this and it was quite visible there was also quite a lot of writing on the wall and in this case it was literally on the walls of a cafe um, in, in, I think this was in Ad Harush in Tigray, where, um, I mean, the confusion in, in people's migration trajectory decisions was, um, was quite uh, clear. I don't know where I'm, uh, where I'm going, but I'm on my way. And that kind of captured uh, what, or what I was thinking as well, that these people are, uh, all they know is that they're heading somewhere and uh, they don't know where they're going. And that, that relates to, to uh, the confusion and also the uh, lack of, um, I mean, the, yeah, the, 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 the lack of comprehension of the kinds of risks that they are taking or uh, um, the flow in the decision-making process that they, uh, that they were embarking on. And so I wanted to see uh, the level of level of trauma. Is there the kind of trauma or traumatization that I'm thinking about? For instance, would we be able to clinically measure it and see and uh, talk about it definitely? Definitively, I also was very interested uh, about collective trauma because. Um, in the kinds of communities that I work with, collective culture, therefore collective traumatization is uh, quite was quite possible. But also uh, the kinds of experiences that we are talking about are, didn't just happen to one person. It wasn't the torture of one person. It was much more comprehensive than that, affecting whole communities, maybe even uh, an entire society. And then, of course, I was interested to look at uh, social, social and economic resilience because that was often given as the reason why people keep moving. They're moving because they want uh, to improve their social and economic resilience. So I wanted to see uh, if uh, lowering levels of trauma and collective trauma will make a difference in perceptions of uh, social and economic resilience. And so, um, you know, we measured, I measured different aspects of trauma, avoidance, hypervigilance, and interference. I also, I, I measured uh, trauma living, uh, using impact of event scale. Uh, and then also uh, I measured collective trauma using um, the social capital scale, as social capital is uh, an aspect of coll uh, collective, um, an aspect of collective trauma. So uh, higher social capital would indicate lower collective trauma. And then we developed a, a socioeconomic resilience scale to measure um, various elements of uh, socioeconomic resilience. And then um, I also developed the idea, I mean, the realization was even if there is collective trauma, even if there is trauma, how, uh, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to able, are we going to be able to lower it, given that there isn't, um, you know, suitably trained and qualified people that know the language, that understand the culture, that know the history, um, anywhere in the world. I mean, there's very few of us Greenland speaking therapists. Um, it would be similar uh, to the Ugandan communities across the world. And, uh, and, and even if there, uh, there is enough, then there is no resources. So there was, it was very important for me to find a way of um, uh, lowering trauma with, without uh, relying on a lot of mental health resources. Uh, so I developed a trauma recovery and understanding self-help therapy, which we also call TRUST. And TRUST is a six-session therapy, which um, uh, I, I, which I understands the uh, which I, which uses the way uh, I don't know some of you would be familiar with EMDR, uh, which is a, a, a very uh, well known uh, approach for trauma. It is a trauma processing uh, uh, therapy, and it, there is a self help element of that. So I use the self help uh, the self help technique of EMDR and. Uh, 
and develop trust with a lot of contextualization for the culture, the language, the societal um, perceptions, as well as uh, understanding the fact that there isn't um, uh, enough therapists or enough resources to deploy therapists, a uh, heavy use of uh, ICT, because we knew that um, that despite, I mean, having a, uh, uh, having a phone, having a smartphone in that part of the world is not a luxury. It's, it's something that you need, uh, people rely on it, for instance, for their, uh, uh, for mobile money. So getting their money from friends and uh, getting money from friends and relatives is one use of um, mobile phones. Also, that's where people um, store their pictures, their documents. That's how they connect with uh, families dispersed all over the world. So we noticed, we, you know, we observed that um, a lot of people have got smartphones. So um, in the refugee context, in the Eritrean refugee context, and then in the uh, Ugandan context as well, uh, it's similar, but also there, there were FM radio stations that uh, could, you know, that, uh, um, that were providing a lot of like podcasts and things like that. So we use that to, um, to, to, um, uh, to uh, what's, what's the word that I'm looking for to implement um, trust and so we, we uh, trust was implemented in the Eritrean scene uh, via an app that was uh, developed for this particular pur uh, purpose and it, it was a video based six videos um, that, uh, that that incorporated various elements of the the, uh, the therapy and then in Uganda as I said using uh, podcasts and our um, our our hope, or you know, our, our theory was based that uh, this would lower post traumatic stress. It will enhance um, uh, social capital and hence lower um, collective trauma. And hopefully, we were looking at higher socioeconomic resilience. The idea is that a lo uh, lower post traumatic stress would give us um, better self efficacy. And hence, that in turn will also uh, result in higher um, um, social capital and hence lower uh, collective trauma. And then that will uh, enhance uh, socioeconomic resilience. So that this, this in a nutshell, was my uh, theoretical framework. Um, and of course, uh, we we thought we felt that the currently uh, irrational mig migration trajectories or mi migration trajectory decisions would uh, would be replaced by more um, uh, you know more rational migration uh, trajectories. So with lower trauma, with uh, higher self efficacy and higher uh, socioeconomic resilience, people would think. Uh, more clearly and make more um, rational decisions about their uh, ongoing migration trajectories. So by trauma, I was looking uh, thinking about the individual impact of uh, experiences that are beyond control and uh, inducing a lot of self-helplessness. By collective trauma, I, uh, it's the impact, the collective impact on the uh, identity and the uh, self-perception of whole communities. And this often also affects uh, subsequent generations. So it becomes intergenerational in that respect. And by social and economic resilience, I refer to uh, the ability of um, individuals and communities uh, to bounce back and rebuild their livelihoods. So the timeline um, of the research was quite long. I'm not going to bore you with all of that. It started with 2013, as I said, when uh, when uh, that boat in Lampedusa sank and it culminates. Now it's still, I mean, there are still elements of uh, curiosities left for me that are affected by the current situation in Tigray in the very areas. In fact, the very refugee camps that I was working in, the two refugee camps that were destroyed by the current um, uh, war in Ethiopia are the two camps that I was working in, Hetzatz and Shemelba. So there were very, uh, there were many research activities, and again, I will not uh, 
go into a lot of details in that. A lot of it was done, um, not a lot, all of it was done in Tigray and in uh, Northern Uganda. Uh, yeah, so trust the, the uh, trauma uh, um, intervention or trauma support uh, technique that we developed um, has, has got three elements to it. It has got um, a, a psychoeducation element, which, uh, which looks at, which builds an understanding of what trauma is for people, explains it to them, explains the symptoms and why the symptoms are there. And then it um, provides them with techniques, simple techniques like breathing techniques, bilateral stimulation techniques, and other trauma processing techniques. Uh, to enable them to process their traumatic memories. And then uh, given that we do understand the, um, the, the, um, the collective nature of the traumatization, as well as the stigmatization that often occurs when people are uh, symptomatic, we also have a social integration element to it, whereby people can celebrate the steps that they have taken to process their trauma and also talk about this uh, at large events and tell uh, their stories, which uh, enables them to reintegrate also, uh, be able to share the resource they've, they've now gained with their community. So in Uganda, uh, we had 400, well, first of all, we wanted to see uh, what, what there is. So we test, uh, we, um, we had a research uh, that involved 471 women who were receiving other sorts of um, uh, counseling to see if it would have an impact on their social and economic uh, resilience. And we found that when uh, people receive um, this was a trust, this was before we developed trust. So when people receive um, uh, therapeutic support or counseling, it does work. But as I said, because of the lack of availability, also the length of time it often takes and the fact that it often comes um, without the context provided. So maybe sometimes it's very Eurocentric. So it's um, uptake is not as uh, wide as we wanted it to be. And if uptake increased, then the system won't cope. So then after we developed um, trust, we tested it again with a, with a larger uh, uh, with a larger cohort. And this time we, we no with a slightly smaller cohort actually, 356 women. And we found that uh, when um, trust was um, uh, implemented, uh, socioeconomic resilience was enhanced and trauma levels were lower. Um, and this was even as compared to, uh, to other forms of counseling support. The findings and the way uh, trust was implemented across whole communities and the impact on wider on the wider community as well as um, as well as the um, on families, particularly wider whole families. So we were working with the women, but uh, whole families were benefiting. So we uh, wanted to really look in and see, um, uh, measure the, the impact. Uh, we wanted to understand the impact on collective trauma. So when we, um, oh yeah, before we did that, uh, we also currently, recently, before I go into the, the to dry part, uh, we have been following the same women and the uh, follow up, uh, the two year um, post. Uh, uh, post-tests also uh, continue to indicate that trust is having a similar impact on socioeconomic resilience, so it's still effective, it's still being used, and um, it's still involving the wider community, so this, this was really uh, pleasing to see. Uh, so in Tigray, we developed it on as, as a mobile app on a mobile phone, but connectivity was difficult, so we had to adapt some of the ways we used it. So uh, rather than using internet connectivity, the, we, were put, uh, we put the videos on um, Vimeo and people, uh, you know, one or two telephones would be uploaded and then people were using 
uh, Bluetooth to upload the videos, but uh, the sequence and the um, gap between uh, sessions was maintained by the research assistants. So uh, this time it involved 103 young people. It wasn't just women, it was men and women uh, across uh, Shmelva and uh, Hezat refugee camps. As I said, the two refugee camps that have been destroyed by the war, unfortunately, completely burnt down. Uh, but th they were the ones that were where I worked. And uh, we implemented trust um, and participants were divided into two groups. One group received the first to the, um, the, the psychoeducation part, uh, element, and the second group received the whole, um, uh, the whole seven sessions. And uh, we tested uh, both groups to uh, pre and post to see what impact it would have. And um, it uh, trust worked on mobile phones really well because participants, uh, as I say, participants were already using their mobile phones to access support from their families and the young people had uh, had had access to, to smartphones because they needed it for um, getting information and support and also staying connected as well as um, safeguarding their um, crucial documents like pictures and birth certificates and academic um, qualifications, etc. So we found also, in, similarly to Uganda, we found we found that um, traumatic uh, levels of trauma were quite high in the initial period. Uh, some people had were receiving very uh, minimal, like what they call livelihood support. So as in Uganda, there was some uh, support pro being provided uh, to them, very uh, limited. It, it wasn't as extensive as it was in Uganda. Uh, so we also wanted to see the impact of, of that. We, we found that um, where the presence of livelihood support or support that was given, material support that was given uh, over and above what UNHCR provides didn't make much difference in terms of people's perceptions of their socioeconomic resilience. So um, trust made a lot of impact in their perceptions. So it, does, it didn't matter whether they were receiving additional support or not. Uh, when they accessed trust, they were able to, um, not only was, was they, were, were they, um, were, was their trauma level lowered and their collective trauma level lowered, they were able, able to see their socioeconomic um, uh, position as being better, not that it improved uh, physically, but it's uh, it, it it just they just um, considered it better. They perceived it to be better because they weren't as traumatized as they had been. Um, and it, it was uh, we used an app called Twenty Four. Well, we tried to use an app called Twenty Four Coms. And also, although we didn't use it in the way like the videos weren't being uploaded on that, it was very difficult because of connectivity. But the texting uh, was uh, the text messaging or questions on text base was used on on the app. And and so there's a lot of room for development in that sense. I uh, in my discussions with uh, Delia and Alex, I. Uh, I I have um, I realized that there's a lot of people interested in delivering uh, well interested in IT and delivering support via IT. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of scope and room for uh, developing better apps, particularly uh, apps that um, don't uh, don't rely so heavily or if they're not heavy that they need a lot of connectivity. Unfortunately, as uh, I keep saying, we couldn't do like in like we did in Uganda the follow up, the two year follow up, because of the current situation in, in Tigray. Um, the fact that uh, a lot of the people that we work with are uh, now uh, have dispersed. We have traced some of them in Addis, and but we couldn't do um, the kinds of tests that we want to do. Um, a lot of them uh, are unaccounted for, which is really unfortunate. Um, and the two camps are um, um, have been have been destroyed, and um, some people may 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 have um, 
had to leave the country and some people may be in Libya and they may even be amongst the people that are now uh, trying to make their way to the UK um, where, where we learned that several have died. Um, in conclusion, uh, high levels of traumatic stress, uh, it, it prevents people from uh, settling down because the trauma is inside them. The, 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 what trauma does to people is it, um, it induces a sense of um, danger, makes people feel uh, that the danger is so very present because the, uh, because the brain is, uh, has not reverted back to its normal way of working. Uh, so it's, it's still stimulated by the sense of danger. So this, when, when people live with these levels of trauma, uh, it's very difficult for them to um, settle down and um, consider options elsewhere because the sense of danger is inside them. Um, so they would, um, you know, they would continue to react to that um, sense of danger, and uh, one of the, the consequences could be this um, attempting to uh, move from place to place to avoid uh, that sense of danger. And the crucial thing for, for me was understanding that, uh, looking at current um, policy uh, refugee policies or current immigration policies with this with uh, with trauma informed lens, and you find that a lot of them actually confirm that that's or uh, heightened heighten that sense of danger. Whereby uh, we've got fortress Europe, we've got uh, the deal that was made in Libya to avert people from crossing the Mediterranean. In the US, you've got similar policies, um, which makes it difficult for refugees to move from place to place, which then confirms the, that sense of danger, being in danger or being, uh, uh, being prevented from averting that danger, which makes them take more and more risks. So uh, it's very important that um, um, we improve the mental health uh, of, of refugees, reduce trauma, and, and that would make them feel um, secure and resilient. And trust, amongst other things, is a viable way of uh, building that trust among, uh, among refugees. And in a nutshell, that's what my book is about. And uh, that's what my research was about. And uh, yeah, along the way, I've come across many, many situations that kind of, uh, in the, you know, uh, very sensitive approaches that that um, that builds hope and resilience. One of them is this uh, Sicilian carpenter who was making crosses out of the boat that was uh, destroyed and giving it to people as a symbol of hope. And uh, and I thought that was a very touching uh, way of. Uh, understanding what has happened, being very sensitive and um, also building hope through that. And that's what I hope, uh, trust, and hopefully this book would do uh, for, uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was really fascinating, both in the substance of what you were analyzing, but also um, um, uh, in, in the way you were able to do it, um, because this was one of the most remarkable, I mean, most difficult subjects to actually to study. And, and, and I'm sure there will be questions about your, uh, your methods and so on. So for those of you who, who are online, please send questions in, in, in the Q&A. Um, I want to just kick off with one question on my because I imagine that many, I'm sure most in fact, of your respondents will have um, lost people. They will be, in, 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 they will have been bereaved and quite possibly they will not have been able to follow what would be the normal social practices for grieving those who die, especially if they, if, if, either if they're those people aren't around, if they're in a different place, or if they actually don't know for sure. And I wondered how, what is the, this question has two parts really. One is what is the possible link between unresolved or pathological grief 
and PTSD. And the other is when, as part of your, your, your therapeutic interventions, people were able to um, deal with that. I didn't quite catch the second question, Alex. The, 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 the second one was really whether as part of your therapeutic interventions within trust, you are you are engaging with, with that question, if, if indeed it is a, as I suppose, a significant question. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, ambiguous loss is, um, uh, it became very uh, apparent very quickly, not just the, the people like, for instance, the people that uh, that died in Lampedusa and all the others before them. Uh, and since uh, the you know bodies are often not recovered and when they're recovered, they're unrecognizable. Even when they're recognizable, you cannot do the, 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 the thing, the, the, um, uh, the rituals that, uh, that are traditional whereby you, uh, you know, you, you, you pray, you bury, you cry for uh, three days, and then there's something that you got to do on day 40, and then there's something that you do on the anniversary. There's, it's very ritualized in the Orthodox uh, tradition uh, where many of those uh, victims of Lampedusa would be, for instance. And, um, uh, and, and people haven't, haven't had that. And this is for those that are confirmed dead. There are many who are not, who have simply disappeared inside the country. We've got so many people who are unaccounted for, who haven't been accounted for at all. Um, en route, people, people have died or uh, people have for many reasons, including the way um, human trafficking has worked, where people have borrowed so much money uh, or paid so much money to rescue themselves. So they, they, they don't want to be traced because they don't, they have no way of uh, paying some of that money, you know, paying that money back to the people uh, that their parents have, or family have borrowed from. So uh, there are many, many people who are um, not in contact, have no, don't want to be contacted, have died, and there is no way of uh, uh, finding who these people are. Many people um, change their identities because they, you know, being traced could endanger themselves or their families. So th there is a lot of complications um that um that that is related to ambiguous loss uh because of the complicated nature of the cause of um, trauma uh trust doesn't actually uh go that much into the causes it deals with the symptoms so uh, for instance it would deal with um uh, flooding or it would deal with um with in the interference, you know, when people have got flashbacks, flashbacks that make them unable to, you know, to work or unable to do, to carry out their day to day activities. So, it, so we give them um, techniques to to uh, you know self soothing and self calming and uh, bilateral stimulation skills so that they could they could deal with those symptoms. Being unable to sleep is the other one. Being highly emotionally reactive. Uh, anger outbursts, panic attacks, and things like that, that people were struggling with so much. So it, it gives them the opportunity to deal with, um, to, to deal, you know, to self-help and deal with these things for themselves, or some, you know, as we found in Uganda for, for their, for members of their family, as well, their children, their spouses, and what have you. So it, it's that, but you are right. Uh, ambiguous loss is one of the biggest issues that, um, uh, that has become a cause for traumatic stress. Hi, yes, um, Katrina Burgess, I teach her at the Fletcher School. Fascinating project and really, really interesting. I work on the Americas and I've been doing a lot of work on the US-Mexico border, particularly with Central Americans. And this all is very relevant to, to what we're seeing in our hemisphere as well. And my question was about um, kind of injecting time into the analysis. And I was wondering on your thoughts, because from what I'm understanding from what you're saying, there's sort of an asymmetric assessment of risk and danger that where they are, they're hypersensitive to risk, but in the as a result, they sort of underestimate 
the risk of going somewhere else of the journey um, if and when they leave wherever they are. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because obviously trauma is occurring at all sorts of different places at different times. And, and sort of how does that interact with how people are assessing risk, where they are, where they are versus where they're trying to go? Mm. I think what I often found is that uh, it's it's the it's the missing uh, uh, the it, it was missing that analysis was missing. They, they it, one of the things that I found trauma did was uh, you know the past and the present. Uh, and perhaps a bit of the future is all uh, uh, messed up. That that time link, that um, sequencing of events is is gone. So th so they haven't arrived yet. Wherever they were, they haven't arrived. They're still on the journey. Uh, so uh, and and in order to just test the, uh, I didn't present it here, but it's in the book. Uh, I also uh, before the before implementing trust, I also had a look at various air train communities in Tel Aviv, um, in Uganda with air trains, and in fact inside the country as well. I had few uh, very small cohort inside the country where I tested levels of trauma and it was very similar quite high for everyone and 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 that um that that uh, timing that that time that lapse uh in time you know i'm on a journey doesn't seem to there there doesn't seem to be an end to that journey so you come across people in Tel Aviv and they, 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 they're still on route somewhere. You come across people in, uh, in Kampala and, you know, they could, they could be having, um, you know, you could be having that conversation in a nice hotel and in a refugee camp. And it doesn't make any, you know, it doesn't make much difference. So they're still on route because they're fleeing from something that has already happened, but the, the brain is not making that distinction. So like that uh, writing on the wall in, uh, in Ad Harush, you know, I'm going, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. That's that that was the sentiment that I was getting. Incidentally, um, again, this is, I write about this in the book. Uh, one of my um, victory moments was when in a focus group discussion, a young man asked me, um, you know where you live in Europe? Uh, do, do they have trauma there too? Do they, do they, you know, do they get traumatized? Are they like us? Do they feel like we do? And, and that for me was a big thing because uh, he's thinking logically about here and there. And, and, and that, was that, that was the beginning of somebody thinking maybe over there is um, difficult as well. There are difficulties everywhere kind of thing. So, so that, that, that for me is the essence of uh, trust is to make people to stop and to think. Would you like me to ask some, we have a few questions. Yes, we have. Okay. So the first one is from Zula. She says, thank you, Salam. I was wondering if an analysis of trauma inhibiting the awareness of individuals to embark upon uncertain journeys might deprive the agency of migrants. There are theories which argue that migrants understand clearly the dangers that they might encounter, but undertake the journey grappling with the prospect of fallibility, but hopeful. Another question is with regards to the self-help aspect to manage trauma, did it impact the collective tools of experiencing and managing it? I'll come back to you on the on the question relating to the self help aspect, but let me answer the first one. Um, I kind of agree. I kind of agree that also I kind I, I that that's exactly what I would have argued before I did uh, I did this research. Uh, I, I always thought no, that's undermining them. People know what they're doing. Um, and in fact, that was my argument against the push and pull theory of migration where where it's assumed that there's a push and there's a pull and the migrant or the refugee in my case is is, uh, is just pushed and pulled um, and I was saying no that's not the case uh, people have got agency always and they are uh, so it's it's um uh yeah, I, I I would have agreed but in the case of um, traumatized, refugees, uh, 
and against the uh, um, in the face of the kinds of danger, the kinds of risk that they were they were taking, uh, I have come to realize that trauma does indeed diminish um, uh, their ability to uh, assess comprehensively or uh, logically in in in. in in the way that I thought they would. Um, a definitive way of, and, and that I, I recognize as a gap in the research that I did, a definitive way was to look at, particularly specifically look at migration decisions. But at the time I, I felt, um, I, could, I didn't have a way of asking directly, you know, how many borders are you, are you planning to cross illegally? Uh, because, every one of those borders are uh, crossed illegally and I didn't feel um, I would get the answer to a direct question like that. So I'm still um, of, uh, of the opinion that um, enhancing uh, their capacity to make that decision is the best way uh, of supporting refugees. If I could get the second answer, because I, 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 I'm not sure I got it all. Yeah, sure. So they ask, in regards to the self-help aspect to manage trauma, did it impact the collective tools of experience in managing it? Yeah. Um, so um, the, the the we the only collective um, element that we have uh, in in trust is the the finalization, which is a big community wide celebration of people um, talking, uh, you know, giving almost giving testimonies about the the journeys that they they took with their traumatic um, uh, memories and what they've done and demonstrating some of their techniques, and particularly in Uganda, where it was a more settled community, uh, it was very um, encouraging to see that 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 uh, you know people were proud they were wearing t-shirts saying I dealt with my trauma ask me how I dealt with it and people were going up to them and asking them so these women who were formerly like some of them were considered mad and um, you know the, these were women who would scream in the middle of the night because of the, their uh, very difficult memories or uh, people who didn't get on with anyone or you know people like women who were given up for you know they were beginning to look after themselves and um they were also they they now had expertise on how to deal with difficult um memories and members of their community uh, members of their family were also coming up and asking them for advice and and so that that is the the community um that's the community element of uh, of trust. Uh, it was a little bit more challenging in um, in 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 Tigray because the community there, the Eritrean community there, was far more mobile. So you, we couldn't be certain that people would be in the same place. But we were encouraging people to do similar things on online. So via social media, people were sharing their experiences, also demonstrating some of the techniques. Um, and we had small community events in in the in the refugee camp so there isn't the idea um, is that lowering um, levels of individual trauma in a uh, on several like many people within the same community would lower the levels of collective trauma it, the way we measured collective trauma was by measuring um, um, social capital so it enhanced the social capital Great. So a few of our viewers are asking about, this is, these are two questions from Alam and Mehratu. Um, they're both asking about the situation in Eritrea and what is really causing Eritreans to leave. And I actually had a follow-up question about if you could just quickly describe what a typical refugee journey looks like from say, Asmara to London um, and, and describe just, you know, what, what is putting these refugees in such a horrible, horrible spot with their mental health? Yeah. Um, so the, the situation in, um, in Eritrea is, um, uh, here, here are a few 
not so fun facts that people find very difficult to believe. Um, the Eritrean parliament, for instance, met in February 2002. Last time they met, perhaps many of you weren't even born. Um, so we don't even have a, 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 a sham parliament or anything like that. We, you know, the, the president rules everything. And um, uh, and the last time, uh, people, a lot of those people who were elected into the people's assemblies have left the country or are, are dead or have are, are themselves in prison now. So there is no parliament. Every 16 or 17 year old Eritrean has to finish high, high school in, uh, in a military training camps, the Sawa camp. And once they finish, they um, are part, part, not once they finish, once they enter um, uh, grade 11, I believe it is, um, once they enter, they are regimented. So they become soldiers effectively. And uh, if, uh, if they if they score high enough, then they're um, sent to these colleges uh, to, to do a college degree. Uh, but if if not, they're just um, drafted into the army and then in the guise of national service. And the national service has been indefinite since um, 2004, I believe it is. Uh, so nobody has been demobilized officially. So. Um, that's why we often refer to it as indefinite national service, or uh, I refer to it as modern uh, modern day slavery, because they uh, they could be used for anything. Uh, in before um, before this about this time last year, it could be uh, anything to do roadworks. Any you know, some were actually um, drafted to do to work in the mine mining industry that uh, that was lucrative for the rest. <laughs> You know, for those involved, but not for the young people who were working on them, um, all sorts of things. Uh, however, since last year, since the war in Ethiopia broke in, uh, a lot have been drafted to fight in Tigray. Um, unfortunately, some uh, are accused of um, committing war crimes. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that that has been a lot are unaccounted for. Many have died, uh, so that's that's uh, that's the kinds of things that are happening inside Eritrea that people flee from. This is for young people. Uh, there's there isn't a single independent newspaper, not not even one. Um, all the uh, all the journalists were taken into prison. Into all the journalists for the independent media, a lot of them were um, university graduates, fresh university graduates, young people full of hope in two thousand and one, and many haven't been heard from since. Some have died in what well, we hear. Some have died in prison. Um, a lot, um, a lot since then have uh, escaped the country. Um, a lot of the politicians who demanded accountability in 2001 after after the previous war with Ethiopia uh, were taken into prison and they also disappeared. Uh, people who belong to faith groups not uh, recognized by the government, i.e. Uh, four, only four religious groups are recognized by the government and um, the rest are considered um, unlawful. And so if you're found um, meeting to, to worship and you belong to one of those unrecognized religious groups, you are taken into prison. There are people who have been in prison since 2002, maybe some even before that. Um, people have died in prison uh, because they were found praying together. Um, what else? Uh, there isn't any, uh, you need special permit, special license to build a house, and nobody has been given that. You can't even repair your house, so a lot of the houses are falling apart and dil dilapidated. Um, yeah, it's pretty grim, and uh, people are uh, 
even even taking the situation um, since COVID-19 for a whole year, I think now there's a little bit of easing. For a whole year, everything was under the strictest lockdown, no school, nothing, and everybody sur uh, survived on handouts from the diaspora. So every member of the Eritrean diaspora including me, my friends, my family, everybody uh, is supporting people inside the country because that's the only way people can um, survive. Um, I think that, I think I've painted a grim enough. <laughs> I'm not going to cause myself some trauma and I'm not going to depress people anymore. And, and the journey from Eritrea to London, that must be... Okay, yeah, yeah, that's that's a very interesting... Uh, it has changed, uh, so that would have changed again since, uh, since the time I did the research. And so the last year, it would be very different because of the war in Tigray. But um, typically, it would be... Um, somebody from, say, Asmara or Mandafara, one of the highland uh, cities, it would be down to either the Sudanese border or to the Ethiopian border. So people pay smugglers to get them there because uh, every young person over the age of, as I said, 16 or 17 is meant to be under this uh, uh, regimented arrangement. So you need permission to move from place to place if you, you know, Outside, just like any soldier. Uh, so people would need fake identities, fake, um, fake permits, uh, or to pay a smuggler to get them from uh, to the to the borders. Once they reach the borders, they again um, another, you know, some people can cross and unaided, but a lot of people uh, again pay smugglers to get them to the other side of the border. Now about, you know, before the war broke out in Tigray, once they crossed the border, then things were relatively easier. I've gone to uh, the reception centers across the borders and further in as well. Um, they looked after them, they supported them, they, um, they were kind to them. And, and I've seen this with my own eyes, but since the war started, I don't know, I don't think Think it's as easy I think it would be very dangerous and also it's quite chaotic in Tigray and as I said the refugee camps have been burnt and the refugees are being targeted by various sites so it's it's very difficult and dangerous on the other side people can um, make their exit via Sudan once they get to Sudan uh, then it's uh, on to uh, Libya or to before they could go to Egypt and um, the Sinai Peninsula into Israel. That hasn't happened since 2012. Um, now it's uh, from Sudan to Libya, from Libya over the Mediterranean to Italy, from Italy then sometimes to Germany, sometimes to uh, to Switzerland, and sometimes to France via France to um, from Calais to um, London, um, and from Calais to London could be on the back of a lorry. Often it's on the back of a lorry. Sometimes it's on the on on the train, um, but it's all all of this is illegal crossings. All of it is dangerous. All of it is uh, hiding and most of it, nearly all of it, is also paying large, uh, vast, vast amounts of money to um, smugglers and traffickers. We get a lot of information of how the smuggling ring works, and uh, but the trafficking um, is goes alongside it, very par parallel. Sometimes the same people could be doing this uh, similar things, but often, you know, when, when, when we hear about um, traffickers being caught, we then find that actually they were the smugglers that were helping people because they are, they they take the you know they they don't they don't understand the system they get caught but of the the big traffickers are um, know how to cover their tracks quite well and they they hardly ever caught. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, we have another question. I'm getting through multiple channels now. Um, uh, have you come across processes of directing uh, this collective trauma within refugee communities towards demonizing particular sections and therefore generating feelings of hatred and vengeance? Precisely. I mean, that's exactly how collective trauma works. Collective trauma uh, fragments communities into uh, 
those who, um, you know, victims and perpetrators, uh, those who got off lightly, those who didn't, those who have got support, those who haven't got support. So it fragments communities and divides and, and where where people were cohesive, working together, uh, trusting each other, supporting each other. It's that fabric that gets broken up. And, and that is what causes um, uh, that, that demonization element comes into it. That it, it creates um, what, 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 the, what in the jargon we call a, a community of trauma. So the, you know, those that were affected by that become uh, quite enmeshed, like, you know, so uh, reliant on each other and understanding the pain and what have you and going over and over the pain. So they become, so everybody else becomes the, uh, the outsider uh, part of the perpetrator or at least not understanding, not empathizing and what have you. The problem then becomes that this very small, uh, very enmeshed group uh, the resources become diminished, so they cannot solve their problems because they, they are inward looking by nature and they cannot, um, they don't trust anybody on the outside enough to uh, gain the, the support and the resources from, from, from that, from that wider group. So, uh, so, so, so it becomes very problematic and everything, all the problems become incubated, and that's how it becomes um, transgenerational. Even it gets passed on to, to to the next generation, who will who will also react, not necessarily similarly to the previous generation, but with the same um, uh, problematic responses to things. So uh, that you know, fragmenting society, fragmenting communities into um, the manas is a classic. Um, a classic Im implication or a, a classic impact of collective trauma. Thank you. And Annie asks, particularly in transit countries, what do you feel are the implications of your findings for policy and where do you feel intervention, if any, could best support your self-help model to empower refugees to make the decisions they'll face on their journey? That's a difficult one. Uh, it, it is, um, I mean, what we have established uh, in, in the work that I did is the fact that uh, using a very uh, low resource um, trauma support works a lot better than a lot of the uh, livelihood support that uh, that is thrown at the camps that can never be enough for everyone and uh, is really uh, 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 an, an expensive way of doing nothing. So there is a lot of uh, uh, what, what they call livelihood support. So they train people to do, for instance, hairdressing or um, cooking or things like that. And these are courses that are or other people are given a small amount of money to uh, buy chickens and have eggs and things like that to sell in the market. But th this, this is a very small amount of um, money to the individual people. It's not enough to make them uh, rebuild a, a proper livelihood. Uh, and, and yet, uh, for the for the NGOs and for the governments that uh, that is implementing projects like this, it's very expensive because there's a lot of refugees. Uh, so in order for that to uh, to be effective, it needs to be uh, given alongside trauma support in recognition of the fact that you need more than giving these people money in order to make them feel safe and um, safeguarded. So, um, so uh, because the sense of danger is inside them. So nothing that we do from the outside will uh, help them feel safe and secure and perceive their um, socioeconomic uh, situation as, um, as, as, as having the ability to, uh, to, to rebuild it. So, uh, so I think the, my message for policymakers is that, um, as we know that there is traumatization in refugees, as we know that a lot of what they escape from uh, is uh, 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 is traumatic, then uh, we need to look at that alongside anything else that we do. Yeah, that's very important. And 
Someone else asked, what do you see as the most appropriate way to expand your research or support uh, to other contexts? Is it ready to be used as a treatment or does it need more research? The biggest plus that we had, the biggest thing that uh, I think the one thing that I'm very proud of is the uh, how how well contextualized it was. So uh, and that doesn't that that takes an understanding of the context uh, of the situation. So um, in order for it to be um, well uh, to apply it to different contexts, then uh, all one needs to do is understand the context of uh, the kind of uh, people that we've got, what their issues are, and how also what what their, um, what, um, obviously the language and the, the culture, understanding that, that, you know, and then contextualizing the, the approach to that. Um, additionally, an, a big area for, uh, or for improvement or a big area for development is obviously the whole app and IT situation, um, delivering psychotherapy or delivering any form of therapy on um, on 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 ICT is not new, but it's a very it's a developing area. And since COVID and all of us have been made to live online, uh, we've learned a lot. And I think we can use a lot of that to to develop better approaches to delivering um, mental health support. Great. Um, Zula also asked, were you able to assess the length of the collective experience of the successful self-help trauma management mechanisms? Um, can, yeah. can repeat the question for me, please. Sorry, were you, were you able to assess the length of time that the collective experience of successful self-help trauma management lasted? Yeah. Well, in um, in Uganda, as I said, we uh, we we went back to it, so two years post the implementation of trust, and um, we uh, we measured, and it was still having a lot of impact on both trauma levels and uh, socioeconomic resilience. So that was a very uh, like two years post the implementation of trust. Unfortunately, in Tigray, we weren't able to do that. Um, so we've only got the data from the um, six weeks post implementation. Okay. Um, Do we have any more? Is that all you have a question? Those, I, I could ask one more. I think we have time for one more. All right. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on this trauma informed lens and policy making, particularly now in destination countries. Um, I'm wondering about, you mentioned something I was reading about the, how the policies in Europe can be traumatizing on the refugees themselves. And so I'm just wondering about what a favor, more, more favorable policy would look like in the so-called fortress Europe. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that's that's something that again uh, something that we need to think about very um, clearly and carefully because um, what we have established, uh, what we now know, is that um, fortressing um, Europe or any other continent hasn't stopped refugees from taking. You know, the the, the higher the fortress, the higher the risk, and that's all there is. Like the, the more the, the more people die, so it hasn't stopped people from trying to um, cross the Mediterranean or cross into Europe or uh, cross into different countries within Europe, taking uh, bigger and bigger uh, risks. So, uh, 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 and, and the response to that, for instance, in the camps, when you go, you've got massive billboards uh, showing all the statistics of people who died and um, quotes from people uh, whose families have died and things like that. And that 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 is traumatic. It doesn't it doesn't help anybody to uh, be able to process. In fact, a common thing that air trains used to say to me was something uh, in Tigrinya. They would say um, 
تخرم خاموت تزرج حكامات. It's like you will die here, you will die there, you will die if you're crumpled up waiting somewhere, you will die if you're stretched out. So, so you you will die anyway, kind of thing. So people people are you know gambling with death and that that sense of um, risk. It, it, it's a different kind of risk um, that they're uh, looking at. So they they're going to die trying. So. If we recognize that, um, rather than make it harder for them to uh, try, then it's supporting them where they are by lowering um, their trauma levels, by um, looking after their mental health as well. Uh, in, and, and then um, they will make the rational decision. Well, Salam, thank you very much. That was a terrific, enlightening, um, disturbing, but also hopeful presentation. We really appreciate you um, joining us and thank you everyone who's here and who, 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 who joined me online. And um, I think, I mean, I, I've learned a lot and, and, and I can see why this is such a, an important area for ongoing research and we should stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.